Oscar Wilde once wrote, to live is the rarest thing on earth. Most people simply exist. That is all. The American dream began as a simple idea that a few brave souls had the vision to believe in and the courage to fight for. Freedom means many things to many people, but to us, it is simply the pursuit of happiness. It's the journey, not the destination, that we love. July.
The only word that breaks the curse is
sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, the place to begin. Love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested. I'm a prisoner someone this morning.
Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we want to thank you, Father, for giving us uh, the privilege of living in this free country. And Lord Jesus, we want to thank you because we know that none of it is about us and that, Father, it is a gift from you. And so, Father, we thank you for today. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we thank you, just like the song said, that you died to make us holy. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So glad that you are here. Let's just get real honest for a second. When that started, did you think something like funny was going to happen? You did, didn't you? I did too. Because that's all we ever do. It was just like, wow, that was almost like really patriotic and wow. I, 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 yeah. Glad you're here, Tim. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, let's go to Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10. This has been uh, an amazing chapter. It, uh, am I echoing? It's like the Grand Canyon. In Luke chapter 10, it has been a, quite a journey. We are walking with Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus, halfway through Luke 10, has basically said, it is time now for me to head to Jerusalem. That is the Washington, D.C. of Israel. That's where all the power is. That's where all, everything that's going to come about with the passion of the Christ will take place. Jesus didn't run into a bad situation and then end up on the cross. Jesus orchestrated from before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time, the Father predestined that his children would be saved through the blood of his son Jesus. That's just incredible. And now he is heading to Jerusalem. He is going there to lay his life down for us. And so let's look at Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke 10, 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I want us to first look at uh, this expert in religious law. Expert in religious law. In Jesus' time, there were quite a few different experts. There were scribes, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were the Sanhedrin, which was a political group. There was the, the ones who worked in the temple. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And there were lots and lots of people who were really, really good about knowing the Torah, 
the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Have you ever run into somebody who is a Christian who knows a lot about Scripture, but you can't stand being around them? Now, by your giggles, you have admitted that you have run into them. Now, if you are that person, you didn't laugh. (laughs) Running into people that are Christians who are really, really knowledgeable and don't have any love and kindness, they suck. (laughs) In fact, this morning, our, our title, I put a title on it, and it's, We Can't Do Enough for God. We can't do enough for God to save ourselves from hell. My original title on Wednesday was Religious Arrogant Church People Suck. And I thought, that's not good to use the word suck in church. So then I sent a whole new set of notes to the guys and ladies and changed it to this one. But the truth of the matter is, The Lord Jesus spent more time and his harshest criticism and his most incredible you you are going to hell type words. Not to those that were caught up in sexual immorality. Not the drunkards. Not the not the, the druggies, not the, not the thieves, not the tax collectors, all the bad people he came to save. All the church people he came to tell them, y'all are messed up. And that is the truth. It does not take long to go through the Gospels honestly to see that we as church people had better be very, very careful about how we treat others out there. Out there. We obviously have to treat each other well in here because we are brothers and sisters in Christ and the this Paul uses, Paul talks about the unity of the church more than anything. Protect the unity, protect the unity. So we got to love each other here. But some of, you, some of us get caught up in thinking, well, we have to love each other here, but then I can act like however I want to with my Facebook, with my Instagram, at work, the way I drive, the way I treat waitresses, the way I treat people not giving me the best service, the way I have my rights, and then I come back on Sunday and it's, hi, I'm sorry but I don't think the gospel's gotten too far. You see, when we have received mercy, what the Lord does is he starts making us, what? Merciful. If you're not merciful, it may be you still haven't received mercy. Mercy. Now, when you do receive mercy and you realize you are a sinner, scumbag, you do the wrong things, you try and do the right things, you end up doing the wrong things, you, when you realize, I'm a mess, I'm a wreck, and then you go, Lord, I'm a wreck, and you receive his mercy and his grace, all of a sudden you're like, oh, that, that was fantastic. Oh, my gosh, Lord, I am in love with you because you are merciful. So we have this gentleman. He's an expert in religious law. This will not be the first time in our study of Luke that this is going to happen. That a superstar church person is going to show up. By this time, Jesus has done enough miracles that the word is out. Jesus did not go to all of the big seminaries and all the big Bible colleges, and he's not known as being a teacher in their system. But he has enough followers now and enough PR that those that want PR and they're losing it, 
uh, they are starting to say, who is this guy? And now we have this expert who shows up. Notice this. In Luke 10, 21, last week we saw this verse. It says, At the same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, and he said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who, what? Think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. What? Thank you, Lord, for bringing this information about me and the Holy Spirit, not to those who already think they're wise and clever, but just bring it to the ones that act like a bunch of children. He gives the Father thanks for that. And then he even adds this, yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Isn't that great? So here's what Luke is doing. In fact, this story, it says, remember verse 25, one day. Well, when we get done with this piece, it's almost then we get back to the journey. Because it'll say, <clears throat> as we were going along, as Jesus was going along. So it's almost as if after Jesus said, thank you, Lord, for showing uh, this great spiritual truth to those who are like children, that then the very next segue is, here comes somebody who is what? Wise, right? And clever in their own thinking. It's almost like Luke's going, oh, Jesus said this. Oh yeah, there was this example of someone who thought themselves very wise and clever. Let me tell you that event. And we find that he says, one day an expert religious law, notice this, stood up to test Jesus. Well, before we get to that and the testing of Jesus, he's not going to be the only one that's going to test Jesus. And we already looked at this in Luke 7, verse 30. It says, but the Pharisees and experts in religious law, well, they rejected God's plan for them. For they had refused John's baptism. The experts in religious law had already rejected John the Baptist's baptism. What was John the Baptist's baptism? It was not a baptism that you and I will have either at the ocean down at the beach or right here in our tub. That is a baptism showing that we have received Christ as our Savior and it's a picture, we get lowered under the water, right? And then we come up out of the water, it's a picture of our future is in heaven with Jesus. We're not gonna stay dead. We're not staying in the grave. To, to immediately, as soon as we die, we are in the presence of Jesus, amen? That's our baptism, okay? This baptism, it, it was for Jews. And it was for Jews, and Jews are going, wait a minute, what do we need to be baptized for? What, what are we doing here? We're Jews, we are born superstars with God. I'm already got it all dialed in just from where I have been born. John the Baptist going, no. You are a child of God, but you're a sinner child of God. You have a sin problem. And so that baptism was one of preparing the Jews to see that they had a sin problem because John came before the Messiah. John's coming and saying, look, you have a problem. John's the one that comes in the doctor's office before the surgeon comes in. John's the one that comes in and goes, hey, we got your records. We, we, got, we got your x-rays. And I, I got to sit down and talk to you about what we see. For some of you, this is very real. And you're like, can't even breathe. You feel like your heart stopped because now you're just waiting for the next words. That's John the Baptist. We've got your charts. We've done the tests and we've determined you're full of sin. And John says, but the surgeon's going to be coming in soon. John's not the, the surgeon, the Savior. John was just the one to say, look, I'm the messenger to say, there's a problem here. The, 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 the religious 
The church people, they rejected that. Why would they reject that? Church people don't like to admit that they're sinful. Church people are church people. So here's what we want to do as the Vine Church. We don't want to be church people, okay? Let's just be a bunch of loser in a family, amen? Okay? Losers in a family. We all know we're sinners. It's by the grace of God any of us are here this morning, amen? And then let's take that loserhood, which is not a word, and let's take that loserhood out there and run into other losers, who are down about their sin and shame and this world has just screwed them. And they're so unhappy with the world. And then we can go, us too. You're just like me. I am? Yes. You should come with me to the person that changed my life. I am a loser sinner. But I have a relationship with the ultimate winner, Jesus Christ. The experts of the law would not admit they had a sin problem. We're born Jewish. We're good with God. This happens a lot of time in just our current day, right? My, you know, you grow up and you have this story. Well, my, my dad or my mom or, you know, grandpa was a Methodist preacher You know, mom worked at the Presbyterian Day School for a thousand years, and there's this kind of like a resume that you're creating in your mind that you've got the right references of people that other were also church people, and that that somehow is going to, you know, you're going to present it to God. Resume? See there? Grandma Lulu, okay? Okay, she was fantastic, right? And my uncle over here. Um, And then we're building this resume to impress God. That's what the Jews did. But they didn't point to a resume. They pointed to God's word and said, look, we're the chosen ones. But they left out all the verses talking about personal sin. And there's a lot of them. So the experts of the law, they don't want Jesus. To want Jesus is to admit you have a need. And I have a feeling 99.99% of us here have said, yeah, there was a day that came that I realized I have a need. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I don't do the things I want to do. The things I want to do, I don't do. I'm an absolute wreck. Would you save me from my sin? Isn't it beautiful? Don't you love when you run into someone who's also a believer, you've never met him before, but all of a sudden, the the Holy there's not two Holy Spirits, but the Holy Spirit in each of you starts going, you know what I'm talking about? So you're going, I've never heard the Holy Spirit go, you're not listening then. And then you have these conversations like, I knew you were, I knew you loved Jesus. I knew Jesus was in you. And then they go, I knew Jesus was in you too. And it's just like, what is that? You know what that is? That's not church. That certainly isn't religion. That's just God at work. Amen? Amen. So the first part is that we got an expert in religious law. Don't ever become an expert in religious law. If you become an expert in something, just make sure you have a huge dose of humility too and recognize that it's all by the grace of God. The second thing is that he stood up to test Jesus. I would make a lousy Messiah, I'll admit it. I would make a lousy Jesus, I admit it. First of all, way too much walking. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Way too much. And he walked here, and he went here. And then you go on a map, and you're like, oh, this is brutal, okay? Um, If I was Jesus, and this expert in, in religious law comes, and he comes to test me, do you know what immediately happens? I get in the flesh. When I have taught my classes at Cal Baptist University, I went to my dean, and I said, hey, I enjoy the teaching, I enjoy the students, I enjoy the college students, and I love those that that don't know Jesus, that all of a sudden realize that there is sin in their life, and then they give their life to Jesus and they get saved. And I love how the lights come on and they're just, I love that. I said, but the problem is, is I've got some students that are smarter than me. And he said, I know. 
And then I didn't know how to feel. <laughs> so you hired me. He said, look, you only have to be a week ahead of them. When they ask a question about a, a future chapter, just say, hey, Phil, it's a great question. And we'll get to that next week. <laughs> I said, you are genius. That's genius. I make a lousy Jesus because if someone wants to test me, I'm going to get in the flesh. This is what's amazing about this passage. Not only does Jesus lead us into the parable of the, the Good Samaritan, but we find Jesus just being so calm, collected. He's not angry. He knows this guy's whacked. But he doesn't embarrass him. In fact, what we're going to find is he actually tells him exactly what he wants to hear. We have to be careful that we ask the Lord, Lord, not my will, but your will. Your will be done. Because he's about to give him exactly what he wants. Why? He knows his heart. He knows it. This isn't Zacchaeus. Okay? A wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the to to see what he could see. Right? Fantastic. This is why you put your kids in the group, man. You learn songs. They learn the Zacchaeus song. It's a great story, but the heart of the matter was with Zacchaeus was he had a heart that was like, I'm a mess and I, want, I, I need help. Our expert here is not coming because he real, realizes he's a, he's a mess and he needs help. He's coming because he has male pride. In Deuteronomy 6, 16, and this is the Torah, the first five books. Deuteronomy 6.16, very important passage. One that this expert in Bible wouldn't have known. You must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa. You must not test the Lord. Now, notice then, if he's going to test Jesus but he's an expert in doing the law, what is he admitting? That Jesus is not Lord God. I can test you, Rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, because you're just a guy who has a lot of fame, has done some magic tricks, but you're not in our system. And I certainly don't believe that you are the Lord God, so I'm just going to test you. If he truly understood and believed that, that Jesus was the Messiah, being someone who has the knowledge, he would never have tested. Zacchaeus didn't test the Lord. He was a mess. But this man tests Jesus. I want to, to show you a passage that's coming, Luke eleven forty two through 46. We'll jump ahead. Again, some more Pharisees, Jewish leaders, pastors, ministers are getting an earful from Jesus. Luke eleven forty two. What sorrow awaits you Pharisees? Now there's an exclamation point there, so it's more like this. What sorrow awaits you Pharisees? Not what blessings. What sorrow awaits you. What's he talking about? After you are gone, once you die, what sorrow awaits you. That has got to be the saddest and scariest passage in all of Scripture. To think you are doing what God wants you to do, only then to have God himself say, you are so far from me, get thee behind me, I never want to see you again, you are out of my sight. Whoa. He says, what sorrow awaits you, Pharisees? And then he gives some examples of what they do. 
for you are careful to tithe, that's to give 10%, okay? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. <laughs> Has anyone ever thought you go out and grow some, you know, cilantro, <laughs> right? Right? Debbie, you had a salsa garden for years. I've always said I want to have a salsa garden, and I still haven't done it. It's just easier to buy the jar. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but Debbie, can you imagine you, you, you got a whole row of cilantro, right? And you go, okay, here's all of the rows. Here's half. That's 50%. Okay? Divide the 50 into five pieces. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's 10%. Okay, and then Debbie comes walking into church to give to the Lord. She's going to tie their cilantro. Because the Scriptures say to tithe your income. This is what they did. Does that even sound remotely fun? It's, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But then you go and ignore justice and the love of God. Ignore the cilantro. God ain't interested in cilantro. Even though I've told you, I think we get to heaven, the language of the angels is Spanish. I'm looking forward to my first heavenly chimichanga. But Jesus is not interested in, oh, way to go, you brought a tenth of the cilantro. And then ignore how you act in love and justice? It says you, it's not, they ignore, that's a big word. You ignore justice and the love of God. And then Jesus says this, you should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. I want you to understand something. There are more important things when it comes when we follow Jesus. It's not all equal. There are some more important things. Now, is all sin sin? It's, it's all sin. However, we also know that there are levels of, not necessarily hell, but levels of, it will be, Jesus said it's going to be far worse for you then. Okay, that tells us. But, when it comes to what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to live, there's some really very important things. What are you getting caught up in in your life? For years and years, uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist, you know, life. And for years when I was a kid, I mean, divorce was... I mean, I, I remember just as a kid watching how, how Christians treated other Christians who ended up getting a divorce, and I remember as a kid going, well, I know Scripture says that that's not something God wants, but I also know that God wants us to love one another and, 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 and to care for them. In fact, we also know of some people that have actually gotten back together and got remarried. There are more important things for us to do. Let me share something with you. If you're coming to church every Sunday, is the most spiritual thing you do all week. Don't come back. Are you with me? Don't come back. If this is the most spiritual thing you do all week, don't come back here. Go to another church that likes church people life, that does the, the church country club thing. My kid's going to Stanford, and da 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 Yeah, go over there. Ain't no Stanford people here. <laughs> well, maybe there are. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? This isn't the most spiritual thing we do. This is the least spiritual thing we do. This is what we do naturally because we have been changed by Jesus Christ. We are magnetized to be with each other. 
We are magnetized to come and to worship God. This is what He has done in us. This isn't what we do to get a check mark off with God. God's like, you want a check mark? I got a son who died on the cross. We go out there, we're counting cilantro, and then we're yelling over the fence obscenities at our neighbor. This is the easy thing to do. You know what the easiest thing I do all week is? Preach. You know what the hardest thing I do all week? Try and live what I'm preaching. This is the easy thing. There's coffee, there's donuts, there's friends. There's the Battle Hymn of Republic. There's air conditioning. This is the easiest. Some of you have got, oh, I went to church. Whoa. You're missing it. You got a neighbor who it's time to blow their world away by you smiling at them. Well, I don't like what... uh, I don't like what political party they're a part of. I don't like the the banners that they have in in their yard. I don't care. I don't care. Go blow a neighbor away by by smiling at them and give them a, hey, Brad, how's it going, bro? You doing all right? For some some of your neighbors are going to be like, he must be higher than a kite. (laughs) He's going to walk in his house and go, honey, the neighbors are doing pot. (laughs) Everyone's doing pot now. Now the neighbors... The church going people. No, no, no. Just blow their world. Be kind. Do you know what kindness will do? It might get someone saved. What would happen if someone walked up to you in heaven and you're laying flat on your face before the Lord because that's what we're all going to do, amen? Amen. Just like, Lord, I, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. Your mercy and your grace. Oh, my gosh, right? That's going to be the first million years, I think. But then while you're laying there, the guy next to you taps you. And you go, huh? I'm in heaven because, um, well, I screwed up your food order at lunch one day. And I, you told me three times that you were allergic and I, I didn't pay attention and it didn't work out well that day but and I knew I deserved everything you had to give out but you were so kind you were so nice to me you know what you don't know is that earlier that week our daughter had, had died of cancer I can't pay all the medical bills. I'm doing this extra job of serving tables. And, and it, and, but you were just, you were so kind to me. And then God used that work of kindness in me. And then nine years later, another kind person came into my life and said that I didn't have to live with my sin and my shame anymore. And that there was an answer for all the dumb, stupid, disgusting things I've done, and and then I came to know Jesus, but I just wanted you to know while our faces are down right before Jesus right here for the next million years, that your kindness started it. Isn't that a great story? It's a great story, huh? Let's do another story. I'm not in heaven, but I worked with you for 30 years. I knew you went to church, but I don't want to be around church people. And then the politics in the United States just got real weird. And you didn't get better, you got bitter. In fact, you got mean and you got ugly. 
I never could figure out why you were so uptight. I just knew whatever you were getting at that church, that wasn't for me. And I got harder in my heart. I got angrier. Because if God really was a loving God, wouldn't he bring kind people who love God into my life? It's a good story, isn't it? It's a good story, isn't it? Do you know why it's a good story? Because it's the truth. People aren't going to get saved because you have invited them to come to the vine. People are going to get saved out there because they have seen the Jesus in you. And if politics and sports and education system and the economy and world affairs are just the most important thing to you, then you might end up being very disappointed on how little of spiritual fruit came from your life for the things that really matter. And there's only one thing that matters. Lost people getting saved. And saved people living so that lost people can get saved. Someone did it for you. Someone did it for me. Someone lived the life so we could get saved. Why then would we say the hell with everyone else? I've got my priorities with politics. I've got my priorities with where this nation's going. And it doesn't matter. We will change the world with our opinions. And Jesus says you will change the world because the world will know that you are love. You see, coming to church, this is easy. It's a great book called The Accidental Pharisee. Basically, he says, we've got to start looking more like Jesus. We've got to start living more like Jesus so that Jesus can do his work through us. Jesus said, what sorrow awaits you Pharisees. You neglect the more important things. In verse 43, it says, what sorrow awaits you Pharisees. For you love to sit in the seats of honor in the synagogues and receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplaces. Yes, what sorrow awaits you. For you are like hidden graves in a field. People walk over them without knowing the corruption they're stepping on. Teacher, said an expert in religious law, verse 45, you have insulted us. You have insulted us. You have insulted us too. In what you just said. Yes. Do you see any political correctness in this gospel at all? A good surgeon tells you it's bad cancer. We got to go in. We're going to rip it out. We're going to do all that we can. That's a good surgeon. A bad surgeon says, Does it offend you that you know you have cancer? Okay. Let's work on your toenails instead. Right? Are you with me? You have insulted us too in what you just said. Yes. Yes, said Jesus. What sorrow also awaits you, experts in religious law. For you crush people with un bearable religious demands. And you never lift a finger to ease the burden. Homework? Homework? We're going to leave. Some of you are like, finally. 
we're going to leave, and here's what we're going to do. For the rest of Sunday, we're not going to worry about our rights. Some of you are going, this is Independence Day. i got all kinds of rights. No, not today. It's Dependence Day on the Holy Spirit is what it is. And we're going to go out, and for the rest of the day, we're going to be kind. And for the rest of the day, we're going to be nice, even to the people we don't want to be nice to. When that happens and you see them coming, this is the Lord at work. All you're supposed to do is just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, oh, help me. Oh, help me. I can't, stand, I can't stand her. I don't like her hair. I don't like her breath. I don't like her shoes. But Lord, that crazy pastor, it was a weird Sunday. I wish I hadn't even gone, but he wants me to do homework and be kind and nice to Martha. So Lord, give me the strength to do it. Yes, that's called walking in the Spirit. When you have weakness, you go to the I need help. Boom, help. And you're kind. Not fake, but kind. That's what we're going to do for the rest of the day. And it just might be that a kind word comes out of our mouth too. And it may just be that the Lord will begin to use us to encourage the lost. Lord Jesus, Lord, we are guilty of being incredibly spoiled. Your blessings of this free country, we are spoiled. We have so many wonderfully good things. So, Father, forgive us if we've made them an idol. Forgive us if we've made them more important than what our calling is, and that is to be used by you in love and kindness and joy. So, Father, just do this great work in us, Lord. Help us. Forgive us. Lord Jesus, for the rest of today, would you just help us to let you come out of us We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Close out in song.
And on that day will you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace? I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I'll lift up my voice in heaven. Thank you. 